Hello, all. welcome to Unit 3, uh, Day 8, and today we're going to talk about the Constitutional Convention. Uh, so we left off talking about the Articles of Confederation and how the Articles of Confederation uh, largely did not work uh, for the early colonies. Uh, it did do a few things well, one of them being the Treaty of Paris, which ended the Revolutionary War. It also created the Northwest Ordinance. Uh, at the time, the Northwest of the United States was uh, Michigan, Illinois, uh, Ohio, and those areas. Uh, so it did set up the parameters for how those areas could, could become a state. And it also uh, outlawed slavery in those areas as well. But despite those few things that did well, it did a lot of things, had a lot of things that did not work out so well. And that is what is going to lead to the Constitutional Convention and the eventual replacement of the Articles of Confederation. Now, with the Articles of Confederation, uh, we are going to have some key people from the American Revolution that would not be at the Constitutional Convention. Uh, one of those being Samuel Adams, who had been very much part of the Sons of Liberty and other revolutionary groups within Boston. Uh, he was not sent by the Massachusetts delegation because they knew that they were coming to create a new federal government, in a sense, and that Samuel Adams was very strong into state government, not a federal government, so he wasn't sent. Um, Patrick Henry, uh, he would choose not to go from Virginia because he said he smelt a rat. And uh, Patrick Henry, not a fan of federal power, and that is why he refused to go. He, he pretty much knew what was going to come out of that Constitutional Convention. Uh, others, Thomas Jefferson, he was overseas in France during that time. Uh, he did correspond with James Madison, who would be at the Constitutional Convention, uh, taking notes and leading the proceedings in a lot of ways. Uh, but Jefferson was not there because he was over in France during that time. Uh, people that were there that would be very influential, again, James Madison, uh, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, and others would be there. Now, out of the Constitutional Convention, you're going to see that with the Constitutional Convention, they really do have to balance the power of the federal government and the state's government, but they also have to keep in mind the varying interests of the different states, and especially when you're looking at sections of the country, the North versus the South, uh, which, as we talked about when the colonies were forming, are going to be very, very different in how things are done, and they had to keep these things in mind. So, one of the big things to come out was representation. How should the states be represented? Uh, under the Articles of Confederation, every state had only uh, one representative. Now, for a smaller state, this meant that they were on equal footing as a larger state. For a larger state, that really meant that, um, in a sense, a small state had the same amount of power as them, which they did, but they didn't have as many people there. So this was going to have to be an issue that they would resolve at that. Because if you think about it, uh, if you're counting votes, a state like today, like California, who has a much larger population than, let's say, Rhode Island, they should probably have more say in what is happening in the government because they are representing a lot more people. Uh, and that's based on population, not the geographic size of the state. So that would be the first issue. Uh, you're going to see and read about the Virginia and the New Jersey plans, uh, which would eventually then be melded together into the Great Compromise, known as the Connecticut Compromise, uh, which would determine how representation would fall. Uh, also, you're going to have the issue of slavery, what to do about slavery. Uh, you're going to see with slavery, largely Congress just kicks that can down the road uh, to be uh, worried about in the future, uh, which is really how the issue of slavery is going to be dealt with until the Civil War. It's just going to be kicked down the road for something for future generations to deal with. Uh, then with that, you're going to have the issue of how to count represent or, uh, population as far as representation. And the question arises, how to count slaves. Uh, and in the end, you're going to see that the agreement that worked out, the three-fifths compromise, which determines that slaves should be counted as three-fifths of a person, which is pretty dehumanizing in my view and most people's view to count somebody as three-fifths of a person just because of the color of their skin. Uh, and again, remember, uh, they were trying to balance the interests of the southern states, the northern states, and a lot of different interests that they had to balance together with this. Um, so there are lots of big questions that they're going to have at the Constitutional Convention and issues that they are going to have to deal with. And what you're going to be looking at today is how they dealt with those issues and what that looked like. And 
really the Constitution kind of starts this battle, which had really been a battle since even the Articles of Confederation, is federal versus states' rights. Uh, which should have more power in this system? Now, you're going to see under the Constitution, uh, they throw into the Bill of Rights the Tenth Amendment, or the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, which says, hey, the states and the people retain the powers of things that are not listed in the Constitution. And you're going to see over uh, the next 200 plus years, even to today, that there is still the question of states versus federal rights. How much right, how many um, powers does a state have compared to the federal government? When can a state stand up to the federal government and say, no, we're not going to do that? Um, and with this, this is something very interesting because you're still seeing this happen even today. Uh, during Barack Obama's administration, you would see the state of Texas and other conservative-led states stand up to him. Uh, now, under Donald Trump, you're seeing uh, states that are led by more liberal governments are standing up against him and refusing to do certain things. Uh, so something that really emerged out of the Constitutional Convention, this issue of federal versus states' rights, is still something that we are grappling with today. Uh, and in fact, some of the things that you're going to see come out of this again, are going to be reoccurring issues in U.S. history. Uh, so the American Republic uh, definitely isn't perfect. Our Constitution definitely isn't perfect. Uh, I will say that at this point in history, uh, the U.S. Constitution has been the most enduring of the constitutional um, republics. Um, who knows how much longer that's going to last? Eventually every empire um, or every yeah, empire will fall. Um, but to this point in history, we have been the most enduring of these constitutional republics. Uh, today, what, what you the big thing that you are going to be doing is analyzing the Constitution. Uh, the activity that you're go going to be doing is going to have you reading through the Constitution and answering questions about the Constitution and the specifics of that. Now, with the Constitutional Convention, remember, they passed the Constitution, they agree on this is what we want, but then they had to go back to the states and get the states to approve that. And the two big states that needed to approve it was Virginia and New York. Virginia and New York during that time uh, had uh, the most power as far as states went. And uh, we don't get to, into a lot of it in class, um, but there were lots and lots of debates in the states, especially here in Virginia. And it's very interesting, uh, if you look at the arguments in the Virginia Ratifying Convention, uh, specifically that Patrick Henry makes, and um, it's almost like he was a fortune teller, uh, because he was able to look at some things in the Constitution and basically say, this is what's going to happen and this is why we shouldn't pass. Uh, one of the things that he mentions is that the president is going to become like a king. Uh, if you look at U.S. history over the past 200 plus years, you're going to see that throughout time, the president has slowly but surely gained more and more powers. Uh, it's accelerated under some presidents like Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, but that you're going to see the president gain more powers. Um, but it's safe to say that when the, when the framers of the Constitution wrote the Constitution, they didn't envision what we have today, like presidents writing executive orders that are treated almost like law and that kind of thing. So, uh, like I said, Patrick Henry and others really foretold some problems with the Constitution, and we still haven't figured some of those problems out, which is very, very interesting. Eventually, though, both New York and Virginia, in very, very close votes, would pass uh, the Constitution. And uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that these opposing sides uh, would become known as the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. And we are going to see that and talking about that tomorrow, about the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists and what their positions really were. And again, how the influence of those two groups would influence U.S. history today. So you see a lot of overlap between these um, days as we're going through this unit. Um, and again, to me, this is very exciting stuff because it's really, it's forming our country. And again, you're going to see that some of the questions and the answers that they had way back then, we still haven't even figured those out. We have the smartest people, you know, alive in history, we could say, and we still haven't figured out some of the problems that those guys were grappling with during that time. So as always, if you need any help, please let me know, uh, get in contact with me and otherwise have a fantastic day.